Hello everyone, I'm Simon Ford of Forge Gin. Martinis, gin and tonics, Negronis, great classic cocktails is what I'm about. But I also love to hear of great recipes from great bartenders from around the world, which is why we've partnered with Beyond the Drink for this season. Cheers. Well, you just heard from the man himself, Simon Ford, and this season of Beyond the Drink is presented by Ford's Gin. I'm Cappy, and this is a segment where some of the best bartenders in the country explain the stories and recipes behind their favorite drinks. To get the recipe from this episode, check out the episode notes in your podcast player or go to beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Beyond the Drink is a production of Beyond the Plate. All right, everyone, for this episode, we're talking with Gabby Monarchik out of Los Angeles. You can find her on Instagram at LA Loving Cup. That's at L A L O V I N G C U P. Gabby's going to walk us through an incredibly delicious, refreshing, and seasonal sounding gin cocktail, which I'm personally excited to hear more about. Please enjoy this episode as we go beyond the drink with Gabby Winarchik. Hi, Gabby. What are we drinking today? Hi, Cappy. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining us. Good. Thanks for having me. So today we're drinking one of my favorite seasonal cocktails, which is a a riff on a Pimm's Cup. Pimm's is obviously a brand name, so you can't actually call it a Pimm's Cup. That's why I've got it in inverted commas. And Pimm's was uh, inspired by a claret mm. cup, which is basically gin and wine that they mixed with like spices and fruits and stuff. And Pimm's jumped onto that bandwagon and made their own bottled premix. So, yeah. So my version was actually inspired by a conversation with a chef. Uh, a few years ago, I was bartending behind a bar in a restaurant called Birch in uh, Los Angeles, sorry, called Mei Lin. Her name is Mei Lin. Chef Mei Lin had just come back from England and had purchased a blackberry pims that's only available in the UK and not available in the US. We just get the brown muddy rubbish. So sorry, pims. So I was really intrigued because I, even as a Brit, I'd never seen this blackberry pims before and um, started kind of playing around with different seasonal ingredients, including blackberry. I tried a blackberry pims. So I did like a blackberry thyme pims. And pims is traditionally, or the breakdown with alcohol is usually two parts of wine or wine based something so I use vermouth and one part gin and as a fan of Ford's gin I I usually use Ford's unless I'm doing something a little bit more unusual then I'll go for um, something that's not a London dry but Ford's is my uh, favorite mixing gin so it's usually one liter of Ford's gin two liters of martini bianco vermouth and it doesn't have to be martini bianco you could do if you wanted have you could use dolin or you can use coke americano or something like that but for this recipe specifically it has to be a bianco style of vermouth or um, fortified wine and then there's one cup of simple syrup that's one-to-one ratio sugar to hot water and obviously call it before using and then we've got 1500 grams of chopped rhubarb thousand grams of halved strawberries and there's no point in using green strawberries because they taste like nothing so use ripest mushy even strawberries my particular favorites are the harry's berries because they're from santa monica farmer's market because they're super fragrant and they taste like a real strawberry and then one english cucumber that you slice up doesn't have to be any particular shape or size, just slice it and a peel of one lemon. And it depends on how much time I've got. If I've got tons of time, then I'll just throw it into a giant cambro with a lid and throw it into the fridge. If I'm doing it for a restaurant and there's usually very little time for production, I will sous vide it um, using my immersion circulator. I'll throw my ingredients into a Ziploc bag and into a warm water bath and set my immersion circulator at 55 degrees Celsius. And that means that it speeds up the infusion process because it's it's heating the ingredients. It's a a warm infusion versus a cold infusion, which is what you'd be doing if you're just throwing it into a cambro. So it speeds that whole process up and then you just rest it for 24 to 48 hours in the fridge and it's, it's generally ready 
my my reasoning for using rhubarb and strawberry is because it's a, a typical summer combination and I love rhubarb and I love strawberry um, both very English ingredients that remind me of kind of Wimbledon um, drinking pims though I've never been to Wimbledon um, drinking pims on the sideline of uh, Wimbledon just sounds like you know the perfect the perfect accompaniment and then once you've made I, I kind of rambled on there sorry and then once no, you've made it. okay once you've made the uh, the mixture it's pretty simple to construct you just fill a tall glass with ice pour over about four ounces of the pims mixture and then I usually do either fever tree ginger beer or occasionally I'll use those Pellegrino Essenza flavored sparkling waters and my particular favorite is strawberry tangerine it's just completely delicious and just garnish with strawberries and mint sprigs and that's pretty much it oh so many delicious questions for you (laughs) this sounds so good because i love you know like diving in i was like sifting through parts of your book and your instagram and i encourage everyone to look at gabby's instagram because correct me if i'm wrong but i feel like you take this different approach to cocktails it's they're really culinary, culinarily driven. And, and I think there's a lot of bartenders that do that, but just with your ingredients, with your techniques. I mean, I saw some of your cocktails with like curry and coconut milk in them. And being a, a food guy myself, it it like I wanted to have a meal of your cocktails. So you talk about your approach to two cocktails. I mean, culinarily speaking, or how you find inspiration to cocktails in general. And then I want to get back to some questions about this drink too. Generally, my inspiration comes from eating. Uh, and I eat a lot, or I used to eat a lot. Pre-pandemic, I'd go out and constantly be eating out. And my favorite foods are generally curries. I love Indian curry. I love Thai curry. Um, Japanese curry is one of my favorites at the minute. So I, I, I kind of pick out all of these um, beautiful aromatic ingredients that you find in something like a curry and use that as my starting point for a cocktail. So whereas I think a lot of people, when they're making a cocktail, they'll, they'll start with the alcohol first. I do it backwards and find an aromatic, an ingredient that I'm really into the flavor of and try and find a spirit that will complement its flavors and build it from there. And most of my cocktails start their lives as non-alcoholic mixtures. And then I will add in the spirits, uh, wines, etc., that I think might best fit that flavor profile. Interesting. Yeah. And then I know you use a molecular driven, you know, approach or techniques for many applications. Do, is this like is this a thing of yours or is it just when the cocktail calls for it or do you like, do you prefer to, to do that? I mean, I, you know, I'm a big old nerd. I love, I love nerding out on gadgets and stuff, but I'm also an impatient bartender. I want things now. I don't want to wait for two weeks for my bitters to be ready. So for instance, the immersion circulator is, you know, is my bestie. I use it for everything, whether I'm cooking a dinner or whether I'm, you know, making an infusion, I use it for everything just because it speeds up that process. And when you're cooking something like meat, obviously you get this lovely tender texture to meat. If you do a sous vide first and then you can sear it afterwards, you just get this lovely texture. And, you know, obviously with infusions, it just speeds everything up. And so it's um, one of my favorite gadgets to use. I started using molecular driven gadgets when I was working for Michael Voltaggio at Inc. He was super inspiring for me and, you know, picked up a a lot of techniques from him and his team and wanted to figure out how I could use these really interesting methods and trans translate them to the bar. Sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't, but the sous vide is the one that has really stuck with me amongst everything else. Yeah. That's very cool. So, you know, if someone doesn't have that in the recipe here, which people can find in your podcast player or on beyond the play podcast.com, there's the method for steeping it essentially or 
you know, steeping this or the sous vide. When you make this, are you because you're an impatient bartender? Are you always using the sous vide if it, if it, if you can or if it calls for it? Are you going to let it? Like, are you going to sense a difference in doing these two techniques or not necessarily? Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's a difference. I think you get more of a depth of depth of flavor if you do a warm infusion as opposed to a cold infusion. Especially because, and, and I'm convinced this is something to do with osmosis too, when you add a little bit of sugar to a, a mixture, like we've got the, the one cup of simple syrup, it's almost like the liquids try and balance themselves out by pulling more of the sugars from the fruit. Whereas if you don't use like heat and sugar in the infusion, um, you get a little less of those like beautiful fruit sugars that are being pulled out, if that makes sense. That's really interesting. So just for the home cook, if you're not an industry type person, I just want to clarify, Gabby mentioned to add everything to a Cambro. A Cambro is just a large, larger container. But if you're making this at home, probably just some kind of large bowl or you know, vessel, uh, I take it would work well. Or mason jar, like a big old mason jar. Yeah. So for sous vide, sorry, I'm, I'm like super into this. The sous is the 55 degrees Celsius. Is that uh, like a pretty standard, uh, temperature for something like this or like when working with alcohol, do you want to stay around a certain temperature or not go above a certain temperature? Correct. Yeah. Cause you don't want, even though you've got a sealed container, you don't really want the alcohol to really evaporate and obviously with you know a ziploc bag you're going to get a little bit of evaporation because it's not completely vacuum sealed i can't afford a vacuum sealer unless polyscience wants to send me one so i use ziploc bags um, and i actually discovered recently the silicone ziploc bags with like a little slidey thingy which is reusable so that you're not wasting all of this plastic oh temperature yeah so you want to you want to stay Below 60 degrees, because I feel there's a little bit of evaporation if you go above that and you lose some of the potency of the spirits. Got it. This cocktail is a, is a larger batch cocktail. It's three liters of liquid it calls for. Is this easy to have? Like if someone wanted to, you know, have it? Yeah, it totally. Work out like that? Yeah. Okay. yeah, totally. Great. This sounds incredible. Thank you. I could talk to you about this sous vide and cocktails for like hours, I feel like. But is there, what, what would you say, is there a place to start? Like I have a lot of friends who are home cooks and they love using a sous vide machine, whether it's sous vide a piece of meat or pork, or chicken, whatever it may be. And I've kind of like dabbled a little bit, kind of trying to do infusions, whether it's, you know, fruit into a, a spirit. Is there like a 101, you would say, I know you mentioned not to go above 60 degrees Celsius, but is there a 101 with where someone could start and kind of have like a, a, a big, like, wow outcome? I think I started doing like tea based syrups in the sous vide. And uh, that was my, that was kind of my entry into the method, the practice of sous viding. Can, can you give me a quick example of just like a basic throw one together? So, I used to use this really expensive smoked tea liqueur that was just like $45 for like 350 mil or something stupid. And I was like, oh, wait a second. This is like Lapsang tea. So I got Lapsang tea and I would throw like a cup of the dry leaves into, into a Ziploc bag with like a quart or a quart and a half of, um, of simple syrup and just let it just hang out there for like an hour Obviously, you get with the extension of the heat um, on the syrup, it um, it draws out more of the flavors of the tea. So you get this real kind of intense tea syrup. Um, and then I would add a little bit of vodka just to turn it into a liqueur, like a high proof vodka to turn it into a liqueur. And that was really kind of my entry into um, sous vide. Okay, switching gears here on our, we have a companion podcast, Beyond the Plate, and all of our guests on Beyond the Plate give back in different ways. It's one of the main reasons why we started the podcast, just because the hospitality industry as a whole is such a giving community. And I think bartenders um, are no different than a chef or a restaurateur in terms of giving back. So we'd like to give you a moment to shed some light on a charitable organization that you 
would like to raise awareness for or support or, you know, a cause that is meaningful to you? Is there is there a cause or an organization you'd like to sh- shed a little light on? Yeah. So um, during the pandemic, a group of bartenders in, in Los Angeles started an organization called No Us Without You. And they started feeding immigrants, undocumented immigrants that work within the restaurant industry. They would collect donations, food donations, you know, uh, diaper donations, formula donations, all of this stuff. And they create these packages for, you know, unemployed restaurant workers that couldn't apply for benefits through the pandemic. And basically, if you donated $40, you could feed a family for a week with your money. So I've been trying to support as much as possible the the guys at No Us Without You, um, just because I think they're doing incredible work taking care of you know a marginalized portion of society that's been ignored by the government um for so many years they're they're you know taking care of families that don't have anything um, and have no way of getting any kind of assistance or or funding or anything so i'm you know i get very passionate about about this project of theirs I wish I had more money. I wish I could just give them millions of dollars, but, you know. Thank you for sharing that. And it kind of leads me to a point that I bring home like nearly every episode and I hope no one gets sick of it if you listen to multiple episodes, but I always say, give what you can, you know, like you're clearly using your voice and I'm sure you've used your dollars and I know you've used your time and those are three different things and all extremely helpful. So while you may not be able to give millions of dollars, I'm sure you've given a a lot of time and, and, and love and support. So I think that's also incredibly important. Yes. Awesome. Um, let's do a little speed round action. Okay. Name the cocktail that inspired you to get behind the bar. Audrey Saunders Earl Grey Martini at Pegu Club. It was a revelation for me. I was like, what is this like sorcery and how do I figure out how to make it? I love it. What's the last cocktail you made at home? A Negroni with Mezcal, Mom and Pop, Blood Orange Vermouth and um, Campari. Yum. What pisses you off behind the bar? You know, what usually pisses me off is people that don't work as a team or on the other side of the bar. It's generally, you know, guests that come in with this self-entitled air that their their needs are more important than anybody else's. Just because I'm behind the bar and serving you, I'm not your slave. And I think that's something that a lot of people that work in the service industry, you know, we get into this industry because it's service over self and we love to, to take care of people. But when you get people that come in and treat you like garbage, then obviously it makes our lives a lot more difficult. Yeah. What makes you happy behind the bar? Oh, connecting with people, working as part of a team. I'm generally these days the den mother of, you know, large groups of bartenders and barbacks, et cetera, et cetera. I'm currently working at, at the spare room in uh, the Hollywood Roosevelt and taking care of a team of what feels like a teenage, you know, team of teenage boys. But I love directing and taking care of them. Um, and I think that's probably my biggest joy is making these like family bonds almost with my crews. That's awesome. One cocktail every home bartender should have in their repertoire. Oh, London Calling. London Calling is a um, combination of gin, fino sherry, lemon, orange bitters, and simple syrup. It's one of it's a super simple cocktail to throw together, and sadly overlooked. Like a lot of people don't know it. And and one of my good friends, Mitch Ono Bushel, um, was the person that introduced me to it, and I'm obsessed with it. I'm definitely ordering that my next so good. time out. That is it for our speed round, but it made me think of a couple other things that I'm curious about. Do you remember the first drink that you ever, like that you ever created that was on, that made it to a menu? I think it was a cocktail that I, I don't name my cocktails anymore because I'm so rubbish at thinking up names, but I think it was a cocktail. What do you mean? Like, do you, do do you have someone else, do you have someone else name them for you or do you just... I don't name them anything. I'm, you know, you know, when you go in a restaurant and you see like all these cocktails on menus and they've got these crazy names and it's like, what does this tell me about the cocktail? It doesn't tell me anything about the cocktail. 
Um, so I generally will name the cocktail either with a number or will list the primary ingredient or, you know, it's, it's inspiration. So like I would have, um, I had a cocktail on a menu that was based on a, an old fashioned, but I called it the newfangled old fashioned, you know, super boring name, but it tells you exactly what the cocktail is. Yeah. You're not calling it like the creaky brown slanted door and you're yeah, like, what the like, hell is what? that? What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> but share more. So you said you'll call them by a number. What what would the number refer to? Um, it, I mean, it wouldn't. It was just a listing. It was a way of listing it. it. That, I think the first cocktail that I made that made it onto a menu was called, was named after a, a Nina Simone song, Cinnamon. And it was a combination of bourbon, Earl Grey tea, mint, and absinthe, as far as I can remember. Mm. And if you ever use an ingredient that you take an interesting approach to cocktails, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, with kind of having an emphasis on the the flavor, the aromatics, and then maybe bringing in the spirit and or spirits um, to to go with it. Did you ever use an ingredient that just like didn't work? Yeah, many. I hate persimmons because they taste like nothing. And I tried and tried and tried doing something with persimmons, and that was just garbage. And then I also tried making a Thai curry inspired Mai Tai, which, you know, in theory sounds like, oh, it should work quite well, but it was just awful. Probably because I used a curry mix that had like garlic and salt in it. So yeah, that I probably shouldn't have I probably shouldn't have used like a curry mix and just made my own curry mix. Is there any ingredient you think is like played out right now in a cocktail? I don't know, you know, like they say Saint Germain is the bartender's ketchup, I guess, elderflower, maybe? Bartender's ketchup. I've never heard that, but it's pretty hilarious. Yeah, pretty <laughs> true, too. I mean, I use <laughs> elements of, you know, like small amounts of St. Germain in cocktails. But, yeah, I probably like elderflower, maybe. I can't think of anything else. Most of, most of the ingredients that I think people are using, I think, I don't think you can over... I don't think an ingredient can ever be overplayed. It just depends on how you treat it, um, what you do with it. You know, I think sometimes like smoking of, of cocktails and having like a smoked something, like a smoked glass, it's a bit, oh, it's a bit, you know, been there, done that. It's not very interesting anymore. But maybe, you know, I think that's it. Let's close it out with what three words would you use to describe yourself? Oh, God. That's the exact what answer a, I was looking what for, a Gabby. What a question. What a question. What three words would I describe myself? Curious, impatient, and a socialist. There you go. Thank you so much, Gabby. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was, uh, yeah, it was fun to talk. I'm, I'm excited to uh, make this make this cocktail, this rhubarb strawberry pins cup. So I'm, delicious. I'm, I'm a pins cup fan. It sounds so so refreshing and, and delicious. So thank you for everything you do. I'm excited to get back out to the West Coast and, and, and find you wherever you are uh, making cocktails. And thanks for all the work you were doing um, and are doing um, to help support immigrant families out there in LA and beyond. So it's, it's incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Gabby. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Andrew. Bye. To get the recipe from this episode, check out the episode notes in your podcast player or go to beyondtheplaypodcast.com. This episode was produced by myself along with Ian Cohen, Joe Yetton, and Sean Petrosian. Find me and keep up to date with this podcast across all social media platforms at On Kathy's Plate or go to beyondtheplaypodcast.com. Beyond the Plate is on all the socials at BT Plate Podcast. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast on your listening site of choice. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Drink, a production of Beyond the Plate. I'm Cappy.